morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please rise and join with me in the call to worship. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. And join with me in the invocation prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus said, Take up your cross. We will follow you, O Christ, into the needs of the world, into God's truth for our own lives, into the pain of our hearts, into the presence of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we will join in the opening hymn, How Great Thou Art, number 16.
scripture today is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. The Beatitudes. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for, wit, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And now Pastor Duane will bring the morning message. Thank you, Betsy. As I said earlier, I'm, I'm just on the downside of bronchitis. I discovered while we were singing the hymn that while I'm singing, I have a tendency to want to cough. So if I cough, I apologize ahead of time. Uh, I did pop a throat lozenger here. I think uh, somebody once gave me a throat lozenger and said, you know, just suck on this while you're preaching, and then when, it's, when, the, when the lozenger's done, you should be done talking. <laughs> so, so we'll see if that works out this way for you guys uh, today or not. I, I think it was actually uh, Kenny uh, Blattenberger. <laughs> so, um, has anyone been following the TV series called The Chosen? Has anybody even heard of it? Yes. I, some people are saying, yes. I, I have to be honest, I haven't been following it. I hadn't even heard of it uh, until maybe a week or so ago. <clears throat> there was a... Uh, a, a trailer about it. The Chosen is a series about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And by the accounts I've been reading, it's actually a rave among Christians. It's a very popular show. Um, as I said, I, I, I saw an advertisement for it, a trailer on the TV, uh, advertising the finale of its current season. It's into its third season already. So that's how, how attentive I've been to, to what's on the on the. Uh, on the news and on the TV. Uh, they're going to release it in movie theaters rather than just on streaming services. The trailer depicts Pharisees bullying Jesus and saying that if he persists in his blasphemy, they will have no other choice but to invoke the law of Moses, to which Jesus replies almost angrily, very forcefully, I am the law of Moses, he says. That really perked my interest when I heard it the first time. Because, you know, Jesus never said those words in the Bible. About the law, he says that he did not come to do away with it, but to fulfill it. As far as Jesus' claims of I am... That phrase conjures up memories of Moses' first contact with God, right? When God is telling Moses to go back into Egypt, Moses asks, who should I say is sending me? And God says, tell them that I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent you. In Mark, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter confesses, you are the Messiah. Most of the I am statements of Jesus are in the Gospel of John. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, I am the true vine. Nowhere does Jesus say, I am the law of Moses. 
as I looked into it then, a little Google searching, internet searching, I discovered that the chosen trailer scene has actually been a source of controversy in Christian circles. So a light bulb came on. That's why they're using that segment to advertise. They want people to pay money to go see it at the movie theaters. As I read more, I discovered that the objection to having Jesus say, I am the law of Moses, is that it's similar to a Book of Mormon text that has Jesus saying something similar to the TV series quote. There's a verse in the Book of Mormon where Jesus says, I am the law and the light. Similar words, not identical, but it's caused an uproar. In an interview about the controversy, the director uh, of The Chosen, I don't think he has a theological background or education, he says, no, the, the line was not taken from the Book of Mormon. The screenwriter simply came up with a great line for the show. And that's not really surprising that producers of a show would take artistic license, right, for dramatic effect, even if it means to misquote what the Bible says. So I'm, I might watch the chosen, the chosen someday, but I'll have to keep in mind that the truth is spun for entertainment. What concerns me is that there are those, even within Christianity, who believe that Jesus is the law of Moses. I guess deeper than that, then, as I think about it, what might it mean if Jesus is the law of Moses? And does it really matter? Well, yeah, it probably, it probably does matter. Spin matters if it moves us away from truth. If it's not a healthy way to understand Jesus, it matters. To view Jesus as the law of Moses, does that lead to better theology, to a better way of understanding of what it takes to live a blessed life, one that leads to everlasting relationship with God in heaven? Or does it lead astray? Well, like so many other things in life, it probably depends on what could possibly be meant by the communicator, by the one saying those words. And it depends upon the receiver and how the words are understood. Is Jesus the law of Moses? Well, one possibility is that it might mean that to follow Jesus is to follow the law of Moses, that the law must be followed to the letter for the grace of Jesus to be open to you. Excuse me. It might also mean, on the other hand, that Jesus replaces the law. I don't think either is a healthy view of Jesus Christ. If following Jesus requires that we follow the letter of the law, then we are still judged by the law and not by grace. So no. On the other hand, if Jesus replaces the law, then as people have faith and believe in Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross, then everything is acceptable. Grace can then be used to justify any activity, and you end up with a society with increasing levels of stress, anxiety, and mental illness. As the Apostle Paul says, grace makes everything lawful, but not everything is helpful. And in fact, some things enslave. Well, a third understanding of, of understanding that Jesus might be the law of Moses, it might be that in saying that Jesus is the law of Moses, that he is the spirit of the law. In his teaching, in his preaching, in his very being, Jesus lives what the law intends to do. I was taught somewhere along the line that the purpose of God's law is to make clear, to make definitive, so there's no mistake about it, our shortcomings and failures. No deflecting, no hiding, 
And since we are not perfect human beings, the law convicts us of our sin. Over the years, I've also observed that following rules, allowing ourselves to be subject to law and rules, is how we show respect. It's how we show respect for ourselves, for God, and for others. Not that we can ever be humanly perfect at it. Jesus embodies the spirit of the law. If that's what is meant by attributing Jesus to Jesus the words, I am the law of Moses, then maybe okay. The intent of the law is fulfilled when God's spirit rules our relationships. If we live in God's spirit, then the law is fulfilled. And here's now where we will turn to our scripture. Chapter 5 in the Gospel according to Matthew. In the previous chapter of Matthew, it's written that Jesus had already created a name for himself all over Galilee and beyond, throughout all of Syria. In his ministry, he not only preached and taught, but he healed. And so people sought him out to hear him and to experience the kingdom of heaven come near. In an act that brings to mind Moses going up to Mount Sinai, Jesus went up a mountain. Some actually think it was Mount Sinai. He went up not to receive revelation, but to share revelation with those who would take the effort for themselves to go up the mountain with him. Although no one knows for sure, my guess is that the disciples with him were more than just the chosen twelve. Jesus proceeds to deliver what is widely known as his greatest sermon, beginning here in chapter 5, chapters 5 through 7. He begins the Sermon on the Mount with what is known as the Beatitudes, eight or nine of them, depending upon how you count. Now, many interpret the Beatitudes as being only words of hope. They are words of hope. Not, not only, but they are just words of hope. Words of hope to those who are oppressed, and so on. In other words, you enter into the blessings of the Beatitudes by first having grief, or having been born with a meek and compassionate personality, or having been born into an oppressive situation. And those are who, to whom the Beatitudes are addressed. In a world of Pax Romano, Roman peace, there's an uneasy simmering of violence beneath the surface in the day of, of, of Jesus, where peace is kept through the threat of violence by a government made strong by micromanagement and taxation. In such a violent world, the Beatitudes are words of hope that turns upside down the existing power structure. If you're powerless in a world where power is abused, blessing, happiness is coming your way. Are you poor in spirit? Your reward is the kingdom of heaven. Are you grieving? Comfort will be yours. Are you a meek personality taken advantage of? Your reward will be to inherit the earth. Jesus' words of comfort are that no matter what's keeping you down, no matter what is oppressing you, depre depressing you, or otherwise making a person a member of the living dead, things change. Jesus promises to invert the problems of the world. He says that what lacks power in the world becomes God's formidable power if you engage in God's spirit. But I think these beatitudes, they're not only messages of hope. They're not only message for the depressed and the desperate, the downtrodden. They're also those for those who display a spirit opposite to what Jesus is preaching. They're antidotes to attitudes 
that ultimately diminish life. Jordan Peterson is quoted as saying that there is no virtue in being powerless. There is virtue in being powerful, yet choosing to be gentle and compassionate. The, the Beatitudes outline attitudes that bring blessing in life. Attitudes that are antidotes to a worldly posturing of power. Attitudes that ultimately really just bring stress. They encourage narcissism and mental illness. Our current generation seems to be very aware that the world is imperfect. And so good intentioned people are working very hard to take down institutions of systemic oppression. What they're missing, I think, is that, you, is that if you take down one system with oppression, another's going to rise in its place. That's because people who are given power within any system are prone to use man-made laws to control and to bully. You don't change a system. You change people. You change people to change the world. And you don't do it through the exercise of power. The Beatitudes outline spiritualities that the powerful would be well advised to adopt. The powerful being those in hierarchical positions as well as those who have charismatic power, the big personality individuals. Power begets arrogance and self-righteousness. And so the Beatitudes provide correctives so that we won't be complicit in an oppressive world. <clears throat> in aviation, attitudes that are highly risky have been identified, and they're taught to student pilots. There's actually a list of high-risk attitudes. Being macho, you hear in the words, watch this. If you're in an airplane with someone and the pilot says that, watch out. It's dangerous. That attitude's caused many accidents. Another one, resignation. Well, there's nothing I can do, so I'll give up. That's also caused disaster. There are a total of five different hazardous attitudes that are taught. And for each hazardous attitude, there's also an antidote. And the hope is that the student will be able to identify his own hazardous attitudes, and then he'll have in his toolbox a corrective action that can be recalled. And those corrective actions are also taught, and hopefully it will moderate that risky behavior. For those who tend to be macho, the corrective action is to recognize how foolish it is to take risk. And for those who think that they can make a who can't think that they can't make a difference, is the realization that the individual can make a difference. You can make a difference in yourself. The Beatitudes speak of hope for the powerless. But they also speak to the powerful. They describe what spiritualities bring forth life rather than attitudes that ultimately cause pain, suffering, or emptiness. Spiritualities that would deny God, that manipulate, that are short-sighted. These need antidotes to lessen the risk of those who think that they have power from eventually crashing and burning in life. Jesus is preaching, one, to those who think that they don't need God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Christ's antidote for thinking yourself self-sufficient and a God in your own right is to intentionally adopt a poor in spirit attitude. Know that God is God and you are not. And live your life knowing that there will be a reckoning day in the kingdom of heaven. 
if you mourn. Now, we may be talking about the grief process, about having lost something, but Jesus is also speaking to those who want nothing but to eat, drink, and be merry. For those who do things that they later should have regrets for, but prefer to, to dismiss their behavior as, oh, it's only natural. The antidote for those is to mourn, to repent of behavior that is not life-giving and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Comfort is found, not in repeating or doubling down on bad behavior, but in repenting and reaching for something better. Blessed are the meek. Now, the opposite of meek might be someone who is forceful. Some would say narcissistic. For those who think they need to push themselves and their personal agendas on others aggressively, Jesus offers that the meek will be the ones to inherit the earth. And by meek, he does not necessarily mean timid or weak, because meek is also and can also be defined as being uncomplaining, unassuming, calm. The self-righteous might be the opposite of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. A self-righteous person doesn't have the capacity. Maybe they don't have the inclination to honestly look at themselves and look at how they present themselves to other people. The antidote is to desire to become a better person, a righteous person. Blessed are the merciful, the compassionate. What would the opposite of being merciful be? Maybe those who are unforgiving, those who are unsympathetic to others, seems like there are people in positions of power or authority who don't ever make room to listen to others. Maybe it's for them. The merciful come from a position of power to acknowledge those who are at a lesser power position, to listen to them and be concerned for them and give them the benefit of the doubt. Blessed are the pure in heart. What would be the opposite of the pure in heart? At worst, maybe dark-hearted, maybe evil. There is evil in the world. Those who are not pure in heart think nothing of taking advantage of people, especially those who are in need. A website shared some examples of the pure in heart. And it pointed to the innocence of most children. A pastor shares some letters in that website he received from children in his church. The one that I like most is from a young lad. He wrote to his pastor, he said, Dear Pastor, I liked your sermon last Sunday, especially when it was finished. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Don't worry, this sermon's almost done. <coughs> Excuse me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Now, how Christians interpret this beatitude has a wide range of beliefs, from those who totally buy into Roman peacekeeping, peacekeeping, to pacifists who intentionally refrain from all kinds of violence, to include physical force. Spiritual peacemakers are most effective early in conflict situations, before the escalation happens. And peacemakers do not back down from engaging and encouraging conversation. Peacekeepers, on the other hand, they're not listed in the Beatitudes. One definition of, says that peacekeepers are those who will silence opinions different from their own by force, if necessary. Well, the brethren have long struggled with what force, if any, might be appropriate 
when others are, are already using force against innocent people. The way of peaceful non-resistance, Jesus says, can be powerful. It does not rely on violence. The last of the Beatitudes, sometimes seen as one, there's two of them, but sometimes people say, no, it's just one Beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And also, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Notice that Jesus doesn't say that you're blessed if you're, if you're persecuted. He doesn't say that. He says you are blessed if you are persecuted, if you are insulted, if you're subject to gossip, gossip because of righteousness, because you are intentionally following Jesus. When you listen to Jesus' antidotes to hazardous spiritualities, and you decide to not exert power over others, make no mistake, you will be persecuted in this world. But Jesus says the reward will be great. So the Beatitudes are words of hope, not only for the powerless, they're words of instruction as well to those who think that they do have power and those who have power. Either way, the goal of what Jesus is driving at in the Beatitudes, I think, is given in the last verse of chapter 5. Jesus says to us, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He's not pointing to human perfection. We can't ever do laws perfectly every time, all the time. But he's calling us to a spiritual perfection in the way of our Lord and Savior. Amen. And let's join in prayer.